Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This evening's lecture event is part of the 13th Annual Kosciuszko Chair Conference. This conference is sponsored by the Kosciuszko Chair of Polish Studies and the Center for Intramarium Studies. This evening, we'll be hearing from Mrs. Monica Jablonska. Mrs. Jablonska is a consultant with expertise in international business transactions and NGOs. She is also a lawyer and philanthropist. Mrs. Jablonska is working on her PhD thesis in political science. She's the author of Wind from Heaven, John Paul II, The Poet Who Became Pope. Her second book about St. John Paul II will be released in 2021. She's a contributor to the National Catholic Register, Crisis Magazine, Newsmax, and other publications in the United States and Europe. Mrs. Jablonska, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. Hello, this is Monika Jablonska. Thank you, Kościuszko Chair at IWP for having me here. Uh, 2020 uh, marks what would have been the 100th birthday of St. John Paul II, as well as the 42nd anniversary of uh, his election as Pope. Today, I would like to make some remarks about St. John Paul II and President Ronald Reagan. Pope John Paul II and President Ronald Reagan were two of the most influential figures of the 20th century. With their will and the power of the spoken word, the Polish Pope and American President together liberated Europe and changed world history. On October 16th, 1978, Karol Wojtyła became the first non-Italian Pope to be elected in four centuries. A hundred and fifty years earlier, Juliusz Słowacki, one of the great Polish Romantic poets, wrote, In the middle of the battle, God will ring a vast bell. For a Slavic Pope, he has also prepared a throne. Listen, a Slavic Pope will come, a brother of the people. In 1981, Ronald Wilson Reagan was sworn in as the 40th president of the United States of America. He became the head of the state at the time when the world looked for a strong leader that could fight against communism. Reagan was a perfect candidate. He brought wisdom, values, loves, confidence, help, support for his country, the world, and Poland as well. Reagan also refocused Americans' attention on God. Pope John Paul II once said, in the design of providence, there are no more coincidences. That is one way to explain why a Polish Pope dedicated above all to defending the dignity of the human person would step onto the world stage as the most powerful country on earth was about to elect a president committed to the cause of freedom. One became the spiritual leader of the world, the other political leader of the free world. On June 7th, 1982, Ronald Reagan and John Paul II met for the first time at the Vatican Library, where they talked for about an hour. As John O'Sullivan, a senior speechwriter for Margaret Thatcher observed, it is almost certain that both men were entirely candid. Each saw the other as a natural ally, and this could have been their only opportunity to compare notes in person. What was important, and it turned out to be very important, was that Reagan has convinced the Pope that he has sincerely committed to peace and discernment, and that these commitments, these commitments, would shape his policy. The first meeting ever between John Paul II and Ronald Reagan was very important for each of them. Journalist Carl Bernstein supposes that in that meeting, Reagan and the Pope agreed to undertake a clandestine campaign to hasten the dissolution of the communist empire. Both the Pope and the president were convinced that Poland could be broken out of the Soviet orbit if the Vatican and the United States committed their resources to destabilizing the Polish 
communist government and keeping the outlawed solidarity movement alive after the declaration of martial law in 1981. The American politician and the Roman pontiff strongly believed that solidarity could crack the Iron Curtain and overturn communism. In the Pope and the President historian, Dr. Paul Kengor exclaims, Reagan and the Pope translated their divine mission into a practical mission to maintain solidarity. It was also a meeting of a men of the theater, yes. As George Weigel puts it, the fact that they were both actors made a great difference, not only in terms of communication skills, but even more importantly, in shaping how both men looked at the human condition and its, and its possibilities. The president and the Pope never discussed their respective uh, theatrical careers in any depth. They didn't have to. Each recognized in the other a shared sense of the drama of the late 20th century life and communism's role in that drama. In their own way, both, President Reagan and Karol Wojtyla used the power of the world to confront evil. It took moral courage to do it, but that evil was easily to identify. It had a face and a name. It was a totalitarian communism system which denied the existence of God and thrived only when human dignity was violated. The Pope and the President thought that evil by refusing to compromise with it and by speaking simply and with clarity about what they stood for. Looking to St. John Paul II as President Ronald Reagan did when the two first met in the Vatican and discovered their shared conviction can help us rediscover the legacy of courage, hope and freedom left for us by the two extraordinary leaders with a sense of purpose whether by coincidence or by design. Let our words be yes, yes, and no, no. Reagan and John Paul II appeared rather different, but in reality, they were quite similar. They both uh, detested Marxism and the Soviet Union. They both opposed the Yalta Agreement. According to uh, George Weigel, they both believed that communism was a moral evil not simply a wrong-headed economics. They were both confident of the capacity of free people to meet the communist challenge. Both were convinced that in the contest with communism, victory, not uh, mere accommodation, was possible. Both had a sense of the drama of late 20th century history, and both were confident that the spoken word of truth would cut through the static of communism's lies and rose people from their um, acquaintances for, to servitude. There were other similarities between them. Both world leaders survived assassination attempts. They both were horrified by the prospect of atomic war. They both believed in God and power of prayer. They both felt they were called by God to do good works for world's freedom. In 1982, John Paul II said that America was called, above all, to fulfill its mission in the service. Those indispensable conditions of justice and freedom, of truth and love, that are the foundations of lasting peace. The declaration of martial law in Poland on December 13, 1981 was a turning point for the Reagan administration. Ronald Reagan immediately commenced action to support solidarity and roll the Soviet backs, Soviets back. Ronald Reagan's administration provided financial aid, equipment and propaganda material to the underground movement. The president also imposed economic sanctions on Poland which eventually would force the communist government into liberalizing its policies. 
There were many existing obstacles, obviously, to overcome for both John Paul II and Ronald Reagan on their way to defeat communism. However, they never gave up on their plan. The Pope and the president fought communist evil by refusing to compromise with it. Their fate gave them a strong common ground to fight against Marxism, Leninism. They both believed they were called by God to do God, good works for world's freedom. Ultimately, communism collapsed. In his Holy Alliance, Bernstein quoted a cardinal who was one of the Pope's closest collaborators. Collaborators. Nobody believed the collapse of communism would happen this fast or on this timetable. But in their first meeting, the Holy Father and the president committed themselves and the institutions of the church and America to such a goal. And from that day, the focus was to bring it about in Poland. Later, what we saw in the Soviet space was the domino theory in action. The USSR imploded. The captive nations regained their freedom. Thus, the meeting of two powerful minds brought significant change into the world. As John O'Sullivan amply summarizes, Reagan and John Paul II certainly cooperated to help free Poland and Eastern Europe from communism. But there is an explanation for this cooperation that is far more plausible than a conspiracy ordeal. Both Reagan and John Paul II were firmly anti-communist and they saw the Polish and European situations in much the same way. There is no doubt that Ronald Reagan and John Paul II became chief actors behind the collapse of European communism. Once the pontiff remarked, everybody knows the position of President Reagan as a great policy leader in world politics. My position was that of a pastor, the Bishop of Rome, of one of with uh, responsibility for the gospel, which certainly contains principles of the moral and social order and those um, regarding human rights. The Holy See's pos position, even in regard to my homeland, was guided by moral principle. Reagan and uh, John Paul II's fate had a profound effect on how they lived and what they did and how they changed the world. Today, we look into the past and clearly see that neither the Pope's soft power revolution nor Reagan's hard power challenge could have done the job by itself. Each needed the other. Together, they provided the keys to victory. The two great men are no longer with us, but our need for moral clarity and moral leadership remains. Thank you very much.